for the class. Um, last time, I, I gave you hints about the, the test one. It should not take you more than 20 minutes, okay? It's, I think it has 25 questions. It's multiple choices, and it's in person. If you miss the test, you must have a very good excuse, and the makeup is always harder, and makeup time is only early in the morning in here in my office. So make sure you don't miss the test. Plus you can have a cheat sheet, you know, half of the paper. And I gave you, you know, hints last time. So it should not be too hard. So the test is Monday. So this coming Monday at um, 10 a.m. the 18th. And I gave you also the date for the final. I think it's gonna be December 4, something like this, in the December 4th at 10 a.m. We're gonna make it 10 a.m. in person. And the final is not cumulative, okay? It will cover only whatever we did between test three and the final. So it's gonna be easier. Okay, so let's start. So here it's a short unit about what you can see yourself in the sky just using a pair of binoculars. A good pair of binoculars is always better than a cheap uh, telescope from Walmart, for example. So you can get them at the army surplus, you know, for a discounted price. Larger they are, better it is. So don't get those tiny, cheap binoculars. It's not going to work. If you cannot invest in a good telescope to begin with, it's like a four or five hundred dollars. So you can invest in a good pair of uh, binoculars. So just to introduce this unit, I have a really cool YouTube um, video. So I hope I won't get in trouble. It's very cool because it's a 360 degrees video. So I never seen that. It's a video you can interact with. I have no idea how to do that, but let's watch. Up at the stars, ancient humans all around the world saw the shapes of heroes and monsters. The constellations of the ancient Greeks were preserved and built upon, first by Muslim astronomers in the Islamic Golden Age, then by Europeans during the Scientific Revolution. In 1922, the International Astronomical Union organized the sky into 88 official constellations, each one with its own story. But this celestial map can be hard to navigate without a guide. So in this video, I'm going to teach you some tricks that you can use to find a bunch of constellations when you go out this summer. The first tip is to get as far away from city lights as possible. I'm here in northern Pennsylvania in Cherry Springs State Park. And if you look at this map of light pollution, you can see that this is an area that's one of the darkest patches east of the Mississippi. You also want to avoid moonlight. And luckily, tonight the moon will be just a sliver. If you start your stargazing trip around sunset, you can start to get your bearings. And this is a 360 degree video, so you can look around by moving your device or by clicking Isn't that drag. Look at this video, I just how they do it. Me. And so that's the west. That this way is north, there's south. And back by the I chair can try to is download east. it, so if you download it, if you look you around, start. you'll start to see a few points of light. It's not some are the brightest anymore. stars, and some are planets, a term that comes from the ancient Greek word for wanderer. They don't stay in the same place, but rove across the fixed pattern of the stars. As night falls, turn to the north and look up. Just follow the arrows, and we'll start our tour. You might recognize one group of stars, the Big Dipper. Four stars form the bowl, and three more the handle. Before optometry, some tested their vision by finding an extra star in the handle, little alcohol. This pair is called the horse and rider. The Big Dipper. You see this? This was used before the optometry was developed. It was used as a test for eyesight. So if you could see those tiny stars here in, in the handle of the Big Dipper, that means you had a good high eyesight and I don't know, they might recruit you to go um, in the army or something like this. isn't an official constellation. It's technically part of Ursa Major. According to myth, Zeus stretched out this great bear's tail as he flung it into the heavens. 
in Greek. So it's not the Big Dipper is not a constellation. The Big Dipper here is not a constellation. Here it's there. It's not a constellation. It's called an asterism, right? Because it's easy to see, but it's part of the constellation, the Big Bear. Bear is Arctos, and the lands that lay in the direction of this bear, north, became known as the Arctic. Some Native Americans also saw a bear in these stars, pursued by hunters. In South Korea, they saw seven devoted suns. And for us, this unmistakable constellation will be a key to navigating the heavens. Start with the two stars at the dipper's edge, draw a line between them, and keep going. You'll run That's into the north star. I have to follow. It's in the tail of a much fainter little bear, Ursa Minor. As the night passes, okay, so Polaris that's stays Polaris fixed in the north star, as all the other the stars star rotate around. I should mention that the night sky will look it. different depending on where exactly you are. At the North Pole, Polaris is directly over your head. As you travel north south, pole, Polaris I moves lower and lower until it, Polaris. it kisses the horizon. Here in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. it's right in the middle. The sky also changes with the seasons. This is the sky now, 10 p.m. on June 11th. But in a month, the sky will look like this at 10 p.m. And by midwinter, the 10 p.m. sky will look very different, with a whole set of winter constellations coming into view. But let's get back to summer and our guide, the Big Dipper. Okay. If we follow that same line from before, from those two stars at the Dipper's edge to Polaris, and then keep going about the same distance again, curving slightly, we'll reach Cassiopeia, look for a W in the star. Cassiopeia, the ancient you know Greeks saw a vain North African queen. queen on a throne, but people in northern Scandinavia and Siberia saw antlers. Okay, let's return to the Dipper. This time, okay, follow a line from the two okay. other stars in the Dipper's bowl down towards the west until you hit a backwards question mark. This is Leo, a constellation that's been recognized as a lion for at least 6,000 years from ancient Turkey to ancient India. Back to the Dipper one last time. If you follow those same stars the other way, far across the sky to the east, you'll hit a bright star called Deneb. It's one of the most distant stars that you can still see clearly because it's so luminous, about 200,000 times brighter than our sun. Deneb comes from the Arabic for tail of the hen, and it is in a tail of a swan-like... So that's interesting because the Greek decided of the constellation, right? They look at the sky and they make those drawing in their mind and they will tell stories about it. But the name of the star were given later by the Arabs. And, and many of the star names are the same that were given to them. So Denim, uh, and it has a meaning here. Constellation called Cygnus. There are two more bright stars a little east of Cygnus. First, by its left wing, Vega, in the constellation Lyra. Second, a little more towards the horizon, you'll see Altair, the flying one. It's in Aquila the Eagle. So I don't know, remember at the beginning of semester, I show you this, okay? It makes a triangle and it's called the summer triangle. So if you connect Denem, Vega, Altair, you cannot see the other stars anyway. So if you have a good pair of binoculars, you're going to see those uh, three stars making a triangle and it's called the summer triangle. Okay, so it's made from three very bright stars from three different constellations. It's called the Summer Triangle. These three bright stars are called the Summer Triangle. Oh, In China, Altair and Vega were seen as two lovers, a weaver and a cowherd, tragically separated by the river oh, of the Milky sad. Way. As the night goes on, look south, and you'll see a bright reddish star really peeking south. over the horizon. This is Antares in the constellation Scorpius. You can follow the line of a... So in uh, Miami, you can see Scorpius because we are very close to the equator. If you are in, the, in South America, it's even better. And you see here, it has a stinger, and right there, that's the center of our galaxy. Okay, that's where the black hole is. Because remember, the Milky Way is like a flat disk. You are located here, so you're looking, you know, through the edge. So Scorpius, it has pinchers and a stinger. And, and you can see it, you have to look south, okay? So Miami, that means you look uh, south beach in the sky, far away from light pollution, and you can see Scorpius, and it has a very bright star here. 
its barbed tail, which looked like Maui's magical fishhook to the people of the Polynesian diaspora. The final stop on our tour is the very center of the Milky Way galaxy. It's near the end of Scorpius's tail, next to the constellation Sagittarius. And I see a teapot here, with a bit of Milky Way puffing out like steam. And if you look right here, you're staring into the exact center of our galaxy. Some stories say Sagittarius depicts a satyr named Crotus, a playful horseman who once, putting his hands together in delight, invented applause. Subscribe to Skunk Bear, NPR's science show. So that's a very cool video. Never seen that before. So I wanted to share that with you. Okay, so we start a new unit, so it's not in the test. And let's see, so first, yeah, you have to remember that all the stars, even the sun, it's so, so far away that by the time rays reach us, they are all parallel to each other because it's so, so far away. So even though the rays of the light, you know, spreading out from the source, from our perspective, they hit the earth parallel to each other. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to introduce telescope because I think you're going to have, did you have the lab yet while you with the telescope? Not yet? You're going to do that in the lab. So anyway, we already talked about telescope, but telescope, it doesn't matter if it's refracting or if it's reflecting, it always has two pieces, right? You have the eyepiece and you have the objective. The goal, the job of the objective is to get the, the light from very, very, very far away objects that are parallel and bring it close to you. Once it's close to you, you know, of course, it's going to be very small because if you look at a tree, for example, far away, it looks small, right? So you bring the tree close to you and the job of the eyepiece is to make it bigger. So you have the objective and the eyepiece. The eyepiece works like a magnifying glass. So the objective takes the light from something very far away, bring it close to you. You're gonna have here, it's called the focus. At that point, you're gonna have the image, very, 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 very small of the star or of the tree, whatever you are looking at. So it will be real. So you can put a screen here, you're gonna have a very small image. And then with the eyepiece, you make it bigger. You can do that, I forgot, but next time I will bring my magnifying glass. If you have a piece of paper, magnifying glass, let's say you put that under the sun, you're gonna have a bright spot on your paper, right? You know that you can start a fire like this. What that spot here is, is just the image of the sun, but very small. So it's called, uh, also you can make a camera like the old camera used to work like that. Yeah, it's called a pinhole camera. So if, if you have like a source of light, like a tree, you have your uh, magnifying glass here. You're going to make it very small here. It's going to be upside down, but you have the image of the tree. So that lens, if it's a refracting telescope, it's going to be very thin. And its job is to bring the image close to you upside down, very small. So then you need the eyepiece as a magnifying glass. That could be a converging lens, like a magnifying glass, or you can use a refracting lens, like the one I have to see far. But, but that's, that's the idea. But now it's not enough. Even if, if you buy a cheap telescope, $30, you can, you can put it in the trash, right? Because they're going to say magnification is times 10. It doesn't matter. If you have a small fuzzy thing and you have a good magnifying glass, you're going to make a big fuzzy thing. It doesn't really help. What you want is a good resolution. And to have a resolution, you want to make the... The, the telescope as big as possible. So that's why nowadays we have 10 meters large telescope. Okay, so here again, 
is the idea, you have something very, very far away, uh, you bring it close to you. So let's say the tree is here, the tree is very, very far away. That here is the objective, it's going to bring the tree here at the focus of this lens and it's going to be upside down and very small. And then you use an eyepiece to make it bigger. That's the idea, okay? You can do the same with a refracting lens instead, but it's the same idea. So for example, here I have a lens and you see that if the object is very, very, very far away, it doesn't show here, but even farther and farther and farther away, the light, okay, the light will be, the rays will be parallel to each other and you're going to get an image here, upside down, real, but very small. So that will be your objective. You can make it bigger with the eyepiece, so you can magnify it. If, if I increase, I'm going to increase the resolution and I will make the image here brighter. Do you see how it gets brighter? You still get an image here because the, the star image is carried by the rays, it's inside the rays, but I'm missing, I'm missing many rays if I have a small one. So if I increase the diameter, I'm going to catch more rays and it's going to be brighter. So bigger is always better. So that's how a telescope work. And for example, if you have I have to bring a demo, it says bring demo here, but I forgot. So if, if you have a magnifying glass, you know, it makes things uh, larger. And for example, we already talked about dark matter. It's 25% of the universe. So here, for example, you have a cluster of galaxies and the light will be bent exactly like the, la the light is bent when it goes through a magnifying glass. So that's why we call that gravitational lensing. So lens make light bands. So again, this is the objective. Something very, very far away is brought here. The light is bent, is brought next to you. It's going to be very small, upside down. And then you need like a magnifying glass to make it bigger. Okay, it's really in a nutshell. So remember, I think it's in the test also, that the first one to take the telescope and to improve it and then to turn it to the heaven was Galileo Galilei. And he, 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 it's not that he said, I invented the telescope, but he didn't say, you know, someone else, you know, I took the idea from someone else. So he didn't say that either. I, actually, he found that telescope in a fair, it was a toy for the kids, right? It was um, it, it was built by an optician here, a Dutch optician. And um, so Galileo took the idea, improved it. So he kind of took credit for it, but we forgive, you know, Galileo because he's Galileo. And he discovered many things linked to that telescope, like the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus. That was the proof that we have a heliocentric system and not geocentric system. The sunspot, that means that things in the heavens don't have to be perfect. They have flow, like the sun has spots. Then also, the moon is not perfect because it has valleys and mountains, and he saw the ring of Saturn. So, uh, misconception, like in the movie, sometimes they show a pair of binoculars with two images. That doesn't happen. If you look for a binocular, you see only one image. That's because of your brain. So a pair of binoculars is just two telescopes. So you have one telescope here, one telescope there. And your brain is smart enough to combine everything together. And that's what you're going to see. 
So again, if you cannot afford a real telescope, a good pair of binoculars and a place where you do not have light pollution, it's great. And again, you should add to your resume, you know, I am an amateur astronomer. I'm hoping to discover, you know, uh, another planet or a new comet. It happened like recently, a Japanese um, person was an amateur astronomer, so not working for a big university or what. And um, he discovered a new comet that visited every 400 years. And it was uh, last night, you could, you could see it if you are light uh, free, away from light pollution. So it's not impossible. Okay, so problems with telescopes. So if you use lenses, you have um, different issues. If you make it very, very, very large. So if you want to use a very, very large lens, it will tend to slack because of gravity. And you do not have this issue if you use a mirror. So it's better to use a mirror. Plus it's easier to scratch a lens and then you have to start over. And if you are like me, I'm short-sighted, you know how expensive those like I had, I bought my glasses, I had to change, it cost me like $300. I mean, this is very expensive to make. So those lenses are very expensive to make because you, you need to have the curvature right. And if you have other issues like astigmatism, like I have, you know, it's even more expensive. So instead they use mirror. In addition, you have something called chromatic aberration. So what is that? It turns out that white light, so light from the sun, for example, or a star, is made of all the colors of the rainbow. And when light goes through glass, it, it tends to bend a different amount depending on the color. And it's especially true at the edge. So if you like photography, you know that can happen. So, for example, if you, if you are a professional uh, photographer, you know that you can get image like this, okay? This is chromatic aberration, and you see you have kind of the rainbow here. So if you go on uh, Google and you want to take nice pictures, they tell you what to do to avoid that. So one way to avoid that is to, um, because it happens mostly at the edge, so you can put like a... Um, uh, you, you can uh, restrain uh, the view just just at the center here. So you put your uh, object, so it goes through the center here and not through the edge. Okay, or you can have some kind of mask. So you restrain the opening, so you avoid this. So that's an issue if for a space telescope, okay, or telescope in general. So that's why we don't use I mean, except if you are an amateur astronomer, they, they don't use lenses anymore, they use mirrors. Okay, so this is called a refracting telescope. So the first uh, one built by Galileo used lenses. And then Newton came along and he invents or he, he, he designed a reflecting telescope. So in that case, the objective, the objective, okay, is made of a mirror, but it works the same way. The mirror is going to collect light from very, very, very far away, bring it close to you, and then you can use an eyepiece to make it bigger. For his invention, um, Newton got, was a member of the Royal Society of London, which is very prestigious. That's how he got to bully everyone there. If, if, if he didn't like you, you know, he would destroy your work. And so everyone was relieved when he passed away. So reflecting telescope also could have issues. For example, if you have a spherical mirror, it's not going to work well because all the light coming from the object, you know, it's not focusing at a single point. So to fix that, instead, we use a parabolic mirror. Okay, and that issue is called spherical aberration. 
So I can, uh, I have, again, I have an app here. So if I go to uh, mirror, okay, so this is called a concave mirror. And you see, like before, if I have a star very, very, very far away, very far away, all the rays will hit parallel to each other and the image will be upside down at the focus and very small. So you don't need a lens for that, for the objective. A mirror is much better because what you do is that uh, nowadays to make these mirrors, they make, they make uh, from small segment, okay? So, uh, uh, connected to each other so they can fix the curvature if they need to. Remember, I think that's also a question in the test. Remember how William Herschel put so much hard work and sweat, you know, how much uh, pain to make those um, uh, mirror, right, out of metal. That was a lot of work with his sister, uh, Caroline, his name was. So nowadays we have uh, new ways to build those mirror. So you take little segments, connected to each other and it's easier to fix like if some some mirror is broken you just take take it out replace it but it's the same idea it works exactly the same way and by the way there was a very famous uh, space walk a Hubble telescope when they built Hubble for the first time they didn't they, they messed up the curvature the curvature of the mirror was not exactly right and that was very bad because it was like millions of dollars project. But the, the, the astronauts went in space and they fix it. And you see the difference between before and after. How beautiful this is, right? You have a nice resolution. So of course, Hubble telescope named after Edwin Hubble, 1927. Okay, so if I ask you for the test, um, if galaxies move away from us, will they be red-shifted or blue-shifted? Red-shifted, very good, okay, because it goes, yeah, okay, so the wavelength increases, the wave, the frequency um, decreases. If it's moving toward us, it's blue-shifted. So if you have mirror, uh, you have to find trick because, of course, if you put your head here to look at the star, you, you're going to remove some light. So it's not that you're not going to see the image. You're going to see it, but it's not being as bright because you are missing some rays. So usually they have a mirror here. They call that the primary mirror. So that will be your objective. Light from very, very far away come, and it will be here at the focus. So at the focus, you're going to have the image upside down very small. And then the eyepiece will make it bigger. Okay, so this is a refractor and this is a reflector. Ay, 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 don't do that. Okay, so you have different uh, design if you're interested. So that, that was like when I made those slides, uh, I, I bet that the prices went up, but it's about $500 to a good, for a good telescope. If you see like uh, $50, $100, forget, okay? It's it's a scam. You need to get a good pair of binocular from the army surplus for a discount, and, and that will be better than a $50 telescope. Uh, in addition to that, so you put your eye here, so that's where you put your eye. And what is very nice nowadays is that you have a gizmo to go with it. So for example, you want to look at Jupiter, you have an app that goes with it, you type Jupiter and then it, it will aim at Jupiter. Okay, we didn't have that uh, when, when I was your age, so very, very cool technology that we have today. And then if, if your goal is to... Um, is, is, is not to look at the sky, maybe you want to look at building, you don't want things to be upside down. Because with a telescope, everything is upside down. But it doesn't matter because if you look at a the planet, there is no top and no bottom. 
uh, star does not have a bump or a down, that if you want to stop people, for example, for some reason, you don't want them to be upside down. Or if you are spying, you know, looking at a building, you don't want things to be upside down. So in that case, you need to add another lens, and it's called an erecting eyepiece. So you add that to your telescope to put things upright again. Okay. So for example, here that was in Paris, you can go up to the Eiffel Tower and uh, you, you can look at buildings, you can look at the Arc de Triomphe, you know, and you have an erect uh, lens added so you things are right up again. So this, this, uh, this is a very old movies, but sometimes movies, even if they are old, they are better than the new movies. Um, it's very famous, if you are into movies, it's by Hitchcock, Alfred Hitchcock with James Stewart. So the, the story is that it's a very famous movie, if you know it, it's called Rear Window. Of course, beautiful um, uh, Grace Kelly, you know, she was the, she became the queen of Monaco and she was in a terrible car accident, terrible, she was very young. So anyway, before she became queen, she was an actress, beautiful actress, very famous. So anyway, in, in that movie, is a, he broke his leg, so he's stuck at home. And at the time, you didn't have internet, you didn't have like uh, TikTok and things to lose your time. So what to do? He stuck his neighbor. And he saw his neighbor digging a hole in the yard and then Turns out the neighbor, you know, killed his wife and he wants to kill him and he cannot escape because he's on a wheelchair. So there was a whole story about that. But you see, the idea is that he has a very nice, like a small telescope here that he used to stalk on his neighbor. Okay, so here are some objects you can see without a um, expensive telescope, just with a nice pair of binoculars, right? And one example is the summer triangle. We cannot see it anymore, but at the beginning of the semester, I show it to you. Again, you have three bright stars that you can even see with the naked eyes. And you have Altair, Vega, Deneb. It's also an Arabic name, Altair, and you see it makes like a triangle here. Okay, so it's called a summer triangle. Another thing that is easy to see is Cassiopeia. Here it's the vein queen. And then here you have the triangular. And you see here in between them, if you use that as a point pointing star, you have the Andromeda galaxy. You can see it with a pair of binoculars. And again, all you have to do is use an app. So I want, let me, tonight, uh, you, you can see it. So let's see, I, I upload here my sky. So it's the website you have in Canvas. And you see here around 9 p.m. So you don't have to stay all night, 9 p.m. You look north, northeast. So for Dordel and a little bit toward the ocean, you should see here, you have Cassiopeia, easy to spot, okay? Because it makes like a W. And Triangulum is here. And right there at the center here, somewhere there, you have the Andromeda galaxy. So it doesn't show here because they only show the, the stars. But again, with the app, you go north, follow the a little bit toward the ocean, look up just above the horizon. You don't have to break your neck. Just above the horizon. We are talking about the sky here in, in Miami. And at 9, 9 p.m., you should see it here. And then if you go just to the north, what we have here, just here, north, north, north. So fall under there, raise your head with a good pair of binoculars, you know, you, you could see here Polaris, the North Star. It, it's, it's hard to see, but this is the small deeper. And just there you have the big deeper. Okay, it's easier to see the big deeper. Okay, so you can do that 
as a homework tonight. Okay, and if I go here, look, look what we have. If we are looking here, 9, 9 p.m. So now you are looking more in the east. So east is the ocean, east. Um, look toward the ocean, a little bit toward South Beach here. Look what we have. We have a surprise that you can see with the naked eye. You have Saturn. You need a good pair of binoculars. I'm not sure you can see with the naked eye. So a good pair of uh, binoculars will help. Okay, so then uh, what else? Okay, so you can see Andromeda. So 2.5 million light years away. So remember, we see it as it was 2.5 million years ago. So we look in the past, okay? So it's a review at the same time. Same thing here, Cassiopeia. If you have a good pair of binoculars, cannot see that in uh, with the naked eye. Not only you can see Andromeda galaxy from Cassiopeia, but you can also see what it's called a double cluster. So it's two cluster of galaxies. That can be seen with a good pair of binoculars. Okay, so say you have an interview, you say, oh, I was out at night and I had a beautiful view of the double cluster, and, and they will be very impressed. Okay, so it's called a double cluster in Perseus. It looks like this if you are looking for uh, a binocular. Perseus, I think he's the one who saved Andromeda from the monster um, because, because her mom, Cassiopeia, was vain. <laughs> so you can uh, look up the story. So again, here you have Cassiopeia, it makes, the, it makes the W, and here you have the double cluster. Okay, so you can see that with a good pair of binoculars. Here we have the three people here, Perseus, Andromeda, and Cassiopeia. Okay, so this is my favorite constellation. I'm just uh, cheating here to see where you can see it at 3.30 a.m. So let's see if I can find it. Southeast, southeast. Okay, so this is Orion, the constellation Orion. A hunter, I forgot what he hunt, was hunting for, but definitely he, you can see a hunter. He has a bow here, uh, the belt, the sword. And right there, you have what is called the Orion Nebula that looks like this. So Orion, also, you can see it with a good pair of binoculars. I don't know if I can find it. I know it's on the south, southeast, but you have to wait from 3.30 a.m., something like this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I found it. Look. Uh, I'm east, south, east. So east is the ocean, south, east is south beach. Okay, so in between, before before uh, sunset, uh, sunrise, sorry, 5 a.m., you can see, that's easy to see. You can see it with the naked eye. Remember, it's the brightest star. Okay, it's called Sirius. It's the a dog, the dog star. Okay, it's attached to its color. And up there, yeah, look at that. You can see Orion. And here you have a very bright star. It's called Betelgeuse. You know, like in the movie, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. So ex except it's not, um, uh, it, that it doesn't write, it's not written the same way. So this is Betelgeuse, it's a red giant. And here you have another star very bright. Riga is a blue giant. So Betelgeuse is swollen, it's red, so it reached the end of its life. 
So it might go in a big explosion, but we don't know we don't know when. So do we see anything interesting here? Here? So just above ah okay okay. Maybe Orion is hunting the Taurus. Taurus is a bird, not sure. So the Taurus, you see the horn here. And here it's a very famous star, Aldebar. So it's also a name, it's an um, Arabic name, Aldebar, and forgot what it means. But it's the fiercy, fiercy eye of, of the bird. So it's a, also a red, a red star here. So that's Taurus here. So it means bird. So that's what uh, Orion constellation will look like if you can get away from the light. You see Betelgeuse, and this is Regal, that's the belt, that's a swarm. Here you see the nebula, the Orion nebula, looks like this. But you need a telescope to see that. Okay, another thing, oh, obviously Orion is hunting the toes, the bird here. Another thing that you can see, the pair of binoculars uh, in the constellation Taurus, you have the Pleiades. Okay, it's also called the Six Sisters. One, two, three, four, five. I don't know where is the sixth one, but it's somewhere here. And it's 400 light years away, Pleiades. So again, you can see it uh, with your naked eye. Taurus or somewhere there, you have the Pleiades. Again, you the only thing you have to do is to um, use your eye. And look at that. So we where we were, we said southeast, right? Look toward the ocean. Ocean, a little bit south beach up there. So you have to raise your, you have to break your neck a little bit. So it's far, farther away from the horizon, and we have a surprise here, and Jupiter is here. So here at 5 a.m. you get early, you want to review for your astronomy class, break your neck, something very bright, will be very bright relative to the other stars because it's closer, and you can see Jupiter, okay? So all that, you know, it's, it's good to know, Stand you apart if you get into astronomy and you have so many information online. So we are very lucky to be in Miami because as I said, it's close to the equator. Okay, so the earth is in the plane like this. But if, if you are um, if you are close to the equator, then you can see part of the Milky Way. It's better if you are in South America, but still you can see it. You can see the Scorpius here, the Scorpion, Pinchers, Stinger, Antares here is a very bright star. And you see the Stinger, the Stinger is close to the center of our galaxy, the supermassive black hole. And those stars, they are called cat eyes because they are very bright and blue, like the eyes of a cat. And let's see if I can find it. Uh, it says where well, is uh, southwest. So first of all, south. Where well, is south? I have to look for south. South. Southwest. So 9.30 p.m., okay, it's not bad, okay, you're still uh, awake, you look south, and now south, but not toward the ocean, toward the land, toward Davis, right, in inland, toward the um, opposite, and west, you want to look west, and a little bit south, a little bit west, then, then you can see the Scorpius, and mainly you will see this star here, Antares, very bright star. And you see here that you have the teapot, you know, we talked about the teapot. And Sagittarius is the constellation. And in between here, 
you have the center of, of the galaxy, the black hole, right? Isn't that a nice teapot? Can't, there, there was a song about the teapot, I forgot. So anyway, the, the supermassive black hole, and this is only because we are in here, we are close to the equator. Isn't that cool? Okay, so get uh, this counter pair of binoculars, get away from the light, and, and you can see all that. That's what you're going to see here. You see the Scorpius, Antares, very bright star. That will be the Milky Way. And this is the center of the Milky Way with a super massive black hole. OK? And now, of course, you cannot restrain, or you don't have to restrain yourself just looking at the stars. You can look at the moons. You can look at Saturn and Jupiter. Jupiter. Um, looks like this, you see the Jupiter with the four moons. So I have found a nice simulation, but I don't know where it is. But but I saved, save it, okay, I'm watching the, 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 the time to see here. Uh, you see here the diameter of the telescope. Of course, smaller will be cheaper, bigger will be more expensive, and um, beginner will be that size here. So let's let's say beginner, uh, large beginner. So let's say maybe one hundred. Okay, and if you look at the moon. That's what you're gonna see. So you still have details. If you look at, um, it's 47. I'm gonna stop because I have to take attendance, but we'll get back to that. Or, or, or we'll, um, I will share with you the link. That will be Saturn, okay? It's cute, it's small, but still it's cute, right? Okay.